you so much uh, to everyone who came out, and thank you so, so much to Jay and Hazel for making such gorgeous books and putting together such an incredible uh, community, literary community here in Toronto. Toronto. Sorry, I've after three sentences, I've communicated that I'm not from Toronto. Um, <clears throat> These, uh, these are little boxes, these poems. They're sort of like sonnets. And yes, I'm obsessed with sonnets, although Petrarch and Shakespeare might be very unhappy to hear these named as such. Um, I'll read, I'll start with the first poem called What Lucy Used to Be. The first section of the book is uh, dedicated to a, a kind of errant love affair between the narrator of these poems and someone named Lucy. What Lucy used to be, I now am, or rather I accommodate her foibles. They live on in me now that she is gone. For instance, the thin switch of the horse's tail, the barn before sunrise cold as oats, trepidation in a nearby thrush. We believe that the dust layering the indoor ring comes from somewhere close by. After the damage show, during which Lucy won a pink ribbon, we headed to the Amsterdam pub. Lucy still ha had on her dressage silencer. It was then just one of her, I was then just one of her admirers. My only claim to fame was having come up with a slogan for the owls in our local forest, stronger than ever. But from that, I was indeed very famous. I suppose she liked my girlish charm, my keychain of boys. She held the reins absently while the horses grazed in a nearby paddock. Later, on the ranch house roof, we exchanged lockets. When we had sex, it was not exactly life, but more like the Cambridge companion to life, <laughs> with essays of incisive brevity. I have learned several important lessons from my love affair with Lucy. One, I know no Lucy who does not know me. Two, I am a gentle consumer. Three, I would like this bed to be free of stones if at all possible. Four, it is better to be a cabinet maker. Five, when the town doesn't want me anymore, it will say so. So I think, um, after hearing about those uh, cooking blogs in Colin's uh, uh, reading, I, I'll, I'll read um, from a cooking blog from the 17th century. Um, this is based on, I've done uh, some research on, uh, on early modern recipe books, and this came out of some of that research. It's called D'où vient donc le grand assembly? written on the back of a 17th century recipe book. First, concerning the primary importance of the definite article, we divined it was this, the individual, that marrowed our thoughts. We opened the white vellum book of remembrances, binding it to our fingers in diary form. In the book of short remembrances, we found clear cakes made of plague, sent down by the king. In 1705, Elizabeth Freak's husband married a most grievous rainy wet day, first complained of shortness of breath, survived, through doc though Dr. Jeffreys was unable to bleed him. Freak was aided by several courses of turpentine physic, murdered a short while later. The last he saw was shadows of several bodies. Evening light fissured the corn. The sought individual, a voice or form yet ahead, packed in sand like the Seville oranges in the cellar. Viscous gasps pack full the children who have dressed for God. The man midwife said my son would have to be taken out of me in pieces. If the writing is unclear, it may have been cancer or smallpox or the difficulty of the hand. There is no second because there is no duel, only a dark cloud of what has already been written down an English lane. 
She lay in her coffin a long time before getting up to call her cook. Lady Norton has my son preserved in gooseberries. She gave me a recipe to make hogs puddings, but I usually soak my guts in rose water overnight. And I'll read uh, just two more from both from towards the end of the book. This one is called Lean Year. Silence scooped out a hole in one eye and rested. A yellow calm descended on the cabin in the woods, its window yearning for insects. You know the one, next door to your brother by the lake he kept in his pocket. His love of the Atlantic and its great living wires. As a child, you rode through summers, abandoned me to cargo. Then I was the happiest of the world's curs. You knew it and used it against me. You were so small that a boat could sail across you. You built a gourd for me. I blossomed like cellophane under your tutelage. The falsification of papers never happened to us, nor the story about how the rain walked across its stations. Did you never regret the hyacinth fence? Did you hesitate before bucketing your sonnet the night the trees realized they were electronic? We were directly connected like a church and its ether. I only wished for more of the old square sofa and its stopped bodies. I regretted visiting the Hall of Nations. Dear one, life's good in the city. Breakfast on the Manitou Parkway, the green awnings of cars going by. If we lose something, we hunt for it. And if it wants us back, it cups its hands into parentheses. When we get bored, we value. Join me, won't you please? Given the white trees of fire, the gypsum's curtsy. And here's the last poem in the book. The whole book is, a, uh, is sort of an elegy for two people, one intentional and one unintentional. Uh, um, it, uh, the poem started to be written around the time that my friend Jordan Berland, who's a wonderful musician, uh, passed away uh, at the age of 32. Um, and uh, so this poem is for him. And then just as the book was going to press, one of my uh, great teachers of poetry, John Hollander, passed away. So this book is dedicated to them both. <clears throat> and it makes reference to the white happiness, which in a Hunan folk legend is another name for death. The white happiness. When the monks draw breath, they become a way to skate on the creases of rocks. There it was, you again, the lost one. We walked away holding the body that had been left us the doctor tending the crops. Sadness is the kind of thing this house does not discuss. A song of paper, an opera written on the left thigh of a ghost. The West Haven cabbages renowned for their disappearance, the dragonfly with whom you fell in love. Of course I was the lost one, not you, marooned on the gurney, the column of breath tallied and uncouth. Twelve breaths, four breaths, five. We might as well invite our teachers the small cries of metal and stone. Why do you think I am writing now? For you said, pressure this space. You said, everyone needs to be underwater. You said, I am dealing with growth. The punctured lung, the ways of taking leave. A boy in Hunan discovers rice in a folk song, puts on his high line coat. You said, what would it be like if I did not fear my body? Here is a key aspect of ghost opera. When you are done, it is celebration, but no one is left. You find only the missing epinephrine. You craved ancestry, craved music. You said, go down and rejoice. You said, sitting outside a Paris cafe. Another aspect of ghost opera, it is never finished. It is the permission of summer. Thank you. Thank you.